so uh welcome to makers on tap uh today uh this is uh joe hosting and i'm here with aaron and christian and um uh, this is exciting because for a number of reasons actually one we are recording for the first time in our new podcast booth yeah. at, at the makerspace yeah and it's not quite done, so this isn't exactly what it's going to sound like, but it is pretty close. It is covered in foam, it so is... it's about what it will sound like. Yeah, we're missing a window, so there's still some echo, but not a ton. And then um, it's also a special episode, because this is the first episode where we're going to have one of the interviews that I did at IMTS. So uh, we're going to do a whole series of interviews with influential people in the maker community um and i was able to sit down with a few people that i really respect and helped me along the path as i was trying to grow everything i've done and the first interview i happened to do was um john saunders who runs the nyc cnc youtube channel and he runs his own machine shop called uh, Saunders Machine Works and runs uh, also a podcast with uh, John's Grimsmo of Grimsmo Knives called The Business of Machining. And um, the I, I apologize on a couple of reasons uh, for the audio. Uh, we were recording live at a trade show as the trade show is getting out. So there's some background noise that you wouldn't normally get in our podcast. And I was also a little flustered because I was running to a booth to try to talk to somebody. And then in the midst of running to the booth, I run into John and we'd been trying to find time to sit down and do this interview for a couple days. And like, I suddenly had to change tracks because he's like, hey, let's just do the interview now. So... We did the interview now, and uh, I wasn't quite in the headspace. So um, I apologize if I seem a little flustered. I think I even say that in the interview, but that's where it is. So uh, with that, here's the interview with John Saunders from NYC CNC. And then after the interview, um, Aaron and uh, Chris and I are going to sit down and do a little commentary on it, on how we felt it went. So here it is. Okay, so um, I'm here at IMTS uh, at the end of the first day, and uh, this is Joe, by the way, and it uh, has been a crazy day, and I'm honestly kind of flustered, um, but I've got a few minutes here to sit down with John Saunders um, from Saunders Machine Works and NYC CNC, and uh, how's your show been? Good, good. You know, it's, it's funny, we were talking yesterday at about the manufacturing entrepreneurship event you know you come to learn and see machines and catalogs but also to, to, to meet people and you know that's the almost a better resource because it's better to make that phone call in three months or six months when you need help on something when you've had the chance to meet somebody and talk to them yeah and uh, I, I was communicating that with uh, the guys I came up here with the show with because um, for a couple of them this was their first show and I spent a lot of time like don't spend a lot of time asking all these people that you meet, a bunch of technical questions, get to know everybody and build right. those relationships and those connections. And uh, that's been what IMTS has been for me for the last couple of years, is just trying to meet people like you. Right. And uh, you know, building the foundation so I can send an email six months later and, and ask totally. questions and things like that. So um, I, I kind of wanted to sit down with you a little bit um, because you started from where a lot of our listeners are are at now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, machining out of your basement, out of your NYC, your New York apartment. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people put too much emphasis on where they're at and the tools they have, and uh, not enough emphasis on their capabilities and the effort uh, that can go so far. Yeah. Um, you say. 
completely agree. I mean, <laughs> look, it's fun, it's fun to be in a place now where we're moving up the food chain. You know, we've got a bigger shop. We've got a couple of vertical machining centers. You know, we're, we're here to look at a fifth axis. All that stuff is awesome. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be a machine better than the one you own. And there's yeah. always going to be one worse. It's, it's the carpenter, not the tools, you know. Uh, no, do I miss my tag days? No. But, um, but it was great to learn that way, and we ma you make parts, you learn. I made a better decision buying the Tormach because I had the tag, and I made the better decision buying the Haas because I put off the time buying it until I really, really knew what we were making, how to make it, the tooling, and you know, the one thing, it's not an excuse to buy a bad machine, but when you run the lower end machines, it makes you be creative with getting the best material removal rates, and how do you run tooling? Yeah, and I, I think it also, um, it makes you appreciate it. Yeah. Um, it, until I started my own journey with like kind of DIY CNCs and things that I put a lot of effort into building, I didn't appreciate the machines I was working with day to day in my big yellow tractor job. Uh, I, yep. I was programming machines that a lot of people would dream of right. programming and I didn't care. Um, and now uh, I'm, I'm mad at myself for letting a lot yeah. of the, that opportunity pass by. But, but you're better off because you now realize that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I had the same experience when I moved to the you know the, the northeast and the New York City and I was like wow like here in Gainesville, Ohio like there's land and there's it's quiet there's no traffic and you don't realize appreciate that stuff until yeah. you, you don't have it anymore. Yeah. Um, so another thing I've seen a lot of beginning makers do is they invest a ton of money into um, machines that they don't necessarily use or need. Yeah. And um, or they, they buy these machines with these big ideas and then they never follow through. Yeah. Um, so you know, do you think it's a good idea to start with a lower end machine to understand your product, your process, and even yourself a little more? Or like join a makerspace kind of place uh, like River City Labs to understand all of those things? Yeah, if you can, absolutely. I mean, delay, delaying purchases is good. I will absolutely agree that buying something and getting it in your shop or on your floor has no correlation to using it. Like, yeah. you need to be at a point where you just can't not have this machine anymore because you absolutely need it. You have to have it. Yeah. Um, because it's 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 lifestyle creep. You know, it's uh, the reason most people, I think, struggle long-term to save up is because it's so easy to buy that $100 tool or even that $1,000 tool. And if you can put that stuff off, and then all of a sudden you can get to bigger picture stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm I really bad about that, I like this podcast setup thing that I, I threw a bunch of money at because I, I didn't need to, but it was, yeah. um, you know, it's fun and now I'm using it. Um, as you were developing um, your media side, yeah. I, I, even a little bit, uh, did you kind of take the same tact? Uh, you know, I, I've watched... I've watched a lot of your videos uh, throughout the years, and obviously your production is significantly higher now, um, uh, both in quality and quantity. Yeah. Um, and you're not doing it all yourself anymore. Correct. No, we have a Julie now who edits the videos, and she'll help sometimes with filming, but most of the time she's just rocking the editing side. So are you still doing a lot of the filming then? Uh, yep, yep. Oh, that's awesome. But, but what's great is it used to be just me. Now it's Jared or Ed or Alex. Okay. Um, so everyone's kind of, it's basically not surprising to see lots of people having cameras running in our shop and I have no idea what's going on and that's phenomenal. That's a, that's really exciting. Yeah, so cool. your staff is as excited about vid making videos as you are. Oh yeah, it doesn't work if they're not. Like it's funny. It's a funny feeling though to walk up to somebody and be like, "What, what are you? What are you doing?" Yeah. Well, the other day, I, I watched the first video I've seen where it wasn't you. Yep. And I was like, "Who's this dude?" Yeah. This, this isn't the voice that happens after yeah, yeah. this intro. <laughs> That's so cool though. It's good to get fresh energy and a fresh perspective, and um, I still love it. But it's got to be about more than just me. As from a, it just has to. Well, what drove you to share? Uh, you, know, you share so much. The honest answer is uh, uh, when I bought my tag, I was on CNC Zone and sort of on Practical Machinist. It's not the friendliest place for newcomers. No. I knew nothing. And YouTube was barely known. It wasn't in any way popular like it is today. And I literally would go on these forums and I would ask for help. I, w I wanted so much to learn and, and have people help me. And so I thought, look, if I can go on and say, 
I'm taking what you're telling me and at least paying it forward or sharing it or doing a good, you know, you'd be a good member of a community. You yeah, know? yeah. Campsite rules, leave it equal or better than when you came. Yeah. Um, that was all, I never thought it would grow into this. I just thought there's got to be more people interested in making stuff. Yeah. It, that's kind of where the makerspace went and my my slowly growing YouTube adventure has been is you know, my plan was always uh, 10 years in industry and then go teach and, and share my passion. Uh, I didn't realize my 10 years in industry would happen at 32. Um, <laughs> it, th that didn't click. Um, so you know, we, we started doing the makerspace and I, I try to share as much as I can through blogs mm -hmm. and, and webinar stuff that I do through that. And now this podcast, yep. um, it, it, it it's one of my favorite parts of the whole maker community, um, and uh, to an extent, the machinist community. How how much of a drive we have to share our passion and our knowledge. Yep. Um, this is probably the most accepting community when you get to the people that are really doing it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I had the same experience with CNC Zone and Practical Machinists, yeah, right. where I had a lot of people that would tell me, "Well, no, no, what you're doing will never work," and I'm like, right. "Well, right. what are you basing that off of?" Well, I think. Well, I'm going to go try it, and now I'm going to show you that it did. <laughs> but it's not even about proving them wrong. It's just no one was born with perfect understanding of yes. all aspects of GD and T and tool setup and machining and running and fees and speeds. We, everybody learns. We learn at different points, and some people will point out things that we do to this day that are horrifying to them. But never has any of those things ever stopped us or frankly even cost us money or problem. You just learn and you learn and you keep learning. Well, and I think to a certain extent you need that naivety yes. all over the place because that's how you learn, that's how new things are found. Yep. Uh, new methods and, and uh, you spend a lot of time hearing, well, that will never work. Uh, but if you've never heard that and you try it anyway and it does. Right, just keep doing it. That, that, yeah. You know, There's that's, some level of, uh, you almost call it insanity. Yeah. You know, just not caring about what the outside world does and just just pursuing it, which is which is great. Yeah, you know that's uh, that's almost how uh, the guys you met last night on uh, the engineering team for natural fiber welding. Yes. Um, none of us have ever built textile equipment or frankly even seen it in person. Yeah, insane. <laughs> but it's work. Like you're making it work. You're figuring it out. Yeah. So, well, this was awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to take up more time, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Um, if you ever want to talk to us again. Yeah, I'm happy uh, to do a, like we can do a formal s remote podcast type thing. Happy to. Awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. Awesome. Thanks, well, Joe. Uh, this is Joe at IMTS uh, with. Um, John Saunders from NYC CNC. Oh, thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right, so we're back. Uh, you guys just heard the interview. And one thing I forgot to do is our traditional, what are you guys drinking tonight? Christian? Uh, so we had the opportunity of joining our fellow podcasters in the Podcast Alliance um, at our monthly meetup that we do. And so I had a industry um, brewing co-op, uh, and it's a red ale that is delicious. And then I'm drinking their Sunday Sidework Hefeweizen. I am also drinking the Hefeweizen. Because it's delicious. And we split the beer. Cause... And they, they can it themselves. Yeah. In the, in the thing, in yeah. the brewery. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very fun. So we can so... take it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like our podcast booth. Anyway, so you guys heard the interview. I did yeah. the interview. So I'm going to try to not talk a ton. Um, what? I talk so much. <laughs> I talk too much in the interview. You can only handle so much of Joe. Yeah, uh, the world can. I can handle a lot. <laughs> so, what'd you guys think? It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good interview. Um, it's super insightful, especially for a lot of people who are maybe just starting out um, and maybe just getting into that hobby of wanting to make really cool stuff and where they're going with it. Um, I, uh, early on in the interview, he immediately uh, mentioned one thing that stuck out to me was the, um, buying tools and just getting into it to force you to learn tools, even if it's something cheap or maybe not the like industry standard at the time, but it will force you to be able to actually learn the tool and get good at the tool. Um, and that's something that like 
I feel a lot of us as makers really get into in the beginning, at least, is that habit of just just freaking do it already. And it doesn't matter how you do it. Um, you can take this to mean programming or tools or anything. Um, I can't say how many times I downloaded really stupid computer programs onto my computer just so I could try and figure out something. And maybe it didn't work so good at first, but it taught me a lot of skills in the in-between. Right. But one of the, one of the key things that he said was um, don't buy the specific tools until you can't go without it. One yeah. of the things that John really um, rallies against is going into debt for tools, which is a really common thing in the CNC or machine tool world that you see is, you know, people buy a uh, super expensive CNC mill and go sixty, seventy thousand dollars in debt and don't have work lined up to pay that debt off, and you know now they're they're stuck with this machine that just sits that they never end up using and then they they're stuck with this debt. So um, you know, it kind of goes in both ways, and uh, it, it's why. Um, when I start out with a lot of tools, I, I tend to start out with the lower end just to make sure that I'm going to utilize it the way I think I'm going to. So, so do you buy the lower end tool before you need it or do you wait till you have a need for it, then buy the lower end tool and then learn from that? Usually I buy the tool when I need it occasionally because, um, I really, I really like buying um, tools and accessories for tools. Uh, occasionally, <laughs> I do the wrong decision and I buy the thing before I absolutely need it. But like in the podcast, I called myself out for buying the mobile podcast setup. I've wanted the recorder that I bought to do that for three years. <laughs> and I haven't had a good enough reason to like really need it until this and since then, I, I've carried this thing in my backpack for the last three weeks, and I've used it a ton uh, for, like, voice notes, and um, IMTS was full of off-the-cuff interviews that you guys are going to hear uh, coming up. So uh, it, it was definitely worth it, and you we're recording on it now. So mm -hmm. uh, in this sense, I waited until I needed it, and I'm really glad that I did because I really appreciate having it now, and uh, I've used it a ton. So it's a really interesting point that he made um, to run a lower quality machine in order to learn how it works and learn its limitations and be creative with it. And I feel like we see that a lot with, especially in 3D printing with a lot of the lower end printers now, like you're seeing with the Creality lines or the, like, the Enders where you have these $200, $300, $400 printers that may or may not actually work great You know, once you get together. But then it forces you to then figure out, well, why doesn't it print great? And you learn, well, I have to learn how to level the bed correctly. Oh, well, now I, I'm i getting some variations and I'm getting some Z wobble. And so that's why my prints are getting kind of wobbly as they go up. And, you know, you get these low-run machines and, and then you're now fixing the problems yourself versus spending more money on a machine that fixes it for you. Yeah. But it still teaches you to learn the machine and kind of get creative and print modifications, upgrades to fix those low-run machines. Yeah. A big part of John's YouTube channel is promoting Tormach machines, which um, sometimes I feel like he gets some flack for in uh, the machinist groups. Uh, but I, I think it's important because uh, those machines teach you how to to use machining techniques like chip load and um, you know, real machining concepts to be able to actually create good parts from harder machine materials like steel or even titanium when you have some of the bigger machines that have a ton of horsepower and a ton of rigidity, you could just barrel your way through it. And as long as your cutter survives, you're okay. Um, but the Tormach teaches you finesse and uh, teaches you techniques to get around that stuff to potentially make much better parts. And um, John Grimsmo, who he does the Business of Machining podcast with, is, is a really good example of that. He he spent years making titanium uh, knife parts on his Tormach 1100. Um, and then once he upgraded to a, an Akuma VNC, he was able to make 
these amazing parts because of all the things that he picked up on his lower quote unquote end machine. So you mentioned uh, that he shares a lot of stuff on his channel. Like what kind of stuff is he sharing for those who aren't aware? Uh, well, um, I found John through Fusion 360 tutorials. So he has, um, he releases several times a week now. He's got uh, Widget Wednesdays where he goes through making an entire project from start to finish, doing the, the CAD and the CAM, and then actually going out and machining the part and talking through the process he went through to machine the part. He does uh, just Fusion 360 tutorials. He does just... Uh, tool reviews and um, machining technique tutorials and it constantly I think he's at a point now where he releases like four times a week and uh, each video is very targeted in a specific manner so yeah it he releases a, a ton of content yeah and, four times a week is nuts yeah <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know when John sleeps, um, but he is definitely uh, an inspiration for the grind. Mm -hmm. So, I have a note here from the interview that talked about campsite rules. I don't remember the context about leaving leaving it better or the same or cleaner or better than when you found it. Oh, it was. Uh... And I thought that was an awesome note to take away just for general makerspace stuff. Well, for general makerspace stuff, he. Um... He was talking about uh, why he started sharing and yeah. you know, taking from the community. But when he leaves the community, it's better because he added back plus some. Yep. Mm. Um, and that's that was kind of where I was, too, because we started while well, I didn't find his videos until later. Um, we started our DIY CNC journeys about the same time. And back then, eight, nine years ago, there wasn't near the resources or community that there is now. And the couple of resources that they were that were there were fairly hostile for beginners. You had to really want it. It was very much the, the Buddhist or the Zen monk idea of like, you're going to get beat for a month while sitting outside the monastery. Um, and then on the 31st day, if you're still there, they'll let you in and welcome you. It, it was very much that kind of attitude and, uh, very much the armchair engineer telling you everything's wrong and you're never going to do that on that weak machine and, or you're never going to, um, accomplish that with that, with that mentality kind of, it wasn't a fun place to be. So you had to really want it. I've read some of the threads. Yeah. They're kind of brutal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, um, so people like John showed up and, uh, you know, people like me who are constantly trying to add um, that that want to share. And, uh, and through that sharing, I, I think we've been able to build a better community that is a lot more accepting and a lot more forgiving for beginners to learn from. And that's been my goal with um, what I've tried to contribute into River City Labs is always trying to foster a creative environment and not a destructive environment. But um, yeah, the, that was the context. Well, that's all the notes I had. All right. Do you have any notes, Christian? Uh, the only one that I just had was the uh, just like we've always said is pursuing that passion that you love. He he kind of ended it on a note of just getting to that point where you just start doing it. And I think that has always been the mission statement of this podcast is just get out there and make stuff. Um, and whether you're making it big, making four videos a week and pumping out a whole lot of content and doing that, or you're just at a local makerspace in the middle of Peoria, Illinois, um, just start making stuff. Um, it, it's just, it's going to push you to be more creative, just making it, mm -hmm. um, and continuing that process. Yeah, that that constant learning and constant growth is, is huge. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, um, I, I think that's that's about it for this one. Um, the next interview we're going to release is uh, Kurt Chan from Autodesk talking about uh, Fusion 360 and the the new um, tier updates that they're going to be doing and some cool features that are coming up and just how the community and Fusion started. So it was a really fun interview to do as well, and I'm looking forward to re- releasing that one. So with that, this is Joe, and keep making stuff. Yep. Keep making stuff. That's my line, (laughs) jerk. (laughs) Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.